and emerging virus is the name we give to viruses that we think are brand new or we never recognized before. So norovirus has probably been around for ages. We just didn't recognize it. We weren't able to culture it, and it wasn't until the 70s when we developed, we looked at stools of sick people by electron microscopy that we discovered the virus. And there are other cases where the virus is brand new, like Ebola virus. It's probably been around a long time, but we discovered it only uh, because it started to cause human disease. Now the term emerging viruses was popularized in the 90s, but these are not new. You know, in all, in all steps of life, we discover or rediscover things and we give them names, but, and this kind of bothers me with this term because viruses have always been emerging as long as animals have been on Earth. But uh, this is the term and now it's stuck. Typically, we like to say since the rise of agriculture, humans started to be infected big time with viruses. Uh, first, because we started to learn how to domesticate animals and grow them in numbers that could sustain populations. And we started to get their viruses. And we also started to live in cities. So the food that was necessary to sustain a city then led to people living together and then they could pass the infections amongst them. So you could say that viruses have been coming into humans since at least this time, but certainly before, in the earliest precursors of humans, viruses have been entering us. So we have inherited viruses from our precursors as well. So emerging viruses can have an expanded host range. So the virus that we know about can suddenly expand its host range, infects humans, we call it an emergent virus. Uh, sometimes we have transmission of viruses from either wild or domesticated animals to humans. That's another example of an emerging virus. This is a specific case called the zoonosis. So a virus that infects an animal that's transmitted to people. Ebola virus infection is a new no zoonosis. It's rarely transmitted to, from person to person unless you are involved in the care of the patient and you're, you're uh, getting body fluids. If you're a physician, you're getting sputum or blood on you, but otherwise it doesn't transmit well. So this is a zoonosis. And sometimes these zoonotic infections establish the virus in the human population. It becomes adapted to humans, and now it's a human virus. So HIV is an example of a zoonosis. It was originally a crossover from simian immunodeficiency virus, which is a virus of chimps and other monkeys, into humans became adapted to humans, now it's called HIV. We'll talk about that in great detail in our lecture on HIV. Sometimes these cross-species infections aren't sustainable. So Ebola is a great example of that. The virus goes from bats to people and it ends in people. It doesn't get transmitted globally. Ebola is restricted to where the bats are that have Ebola virus uh, in them. These are all examples of emerging viruses. So here is just an example of the current viruses that are known to infect humans and what their origins are. And I call this the human-animal interface because really this is where our infections are coming from. Now the 37 here in purple, these are the 37 different viruses. These are what we call zoonotic pathogens. These are the viruses that are always going from an animal into people, and these include Ebola, Marburg virus, uh, Hendra, Nipah, and a bunch of others that we'll talk about today. So pretty much the human is the dead end. They don't become established human pathogens. 32 viruses, again, these are all viruses that infect people today. 32 are what we call adapted pathogens. These were orig originally zoonotic infections. They came from an animal to us at different times in our histories, but they became adapted to us. So examples would be HIV, uh, measles virus, smallpox, some coronaviruses, probably polio, but we have zero evidence for the origins of polio and, and a number of others as well. Uh, and then we have these two slices of the pie, which we call heirloom pathogens. We inherited these from our ancestors, our evolutionary ancestors. So some of them we in inherited from the ancestors of Homo sapiens or Homo species. All right, so that's the 16 viruses. 
So these are quite old, so they, they infected our ancestors and they passed it along to us. And we know this because we can do phylogeny of, of uh, the viral sequence and estimate approximately how long they've been around. And then there are other heirloom pathogens that we uh, inherited uh, by virtue of infection of, of different homo species before homo sapiens. So this is, emphasizes the idea that we are constantly uh, acquiring new uh, viruses from the ones around us. Brand new viruses don't evolve anymore. We get them from what's out there. Now when a, a virus emerges, the press goes crazy. The press loves death and destruction. And so now there's been an outbreak of Ebola uh, in Africa, and of course it's in the press. This was uh, one of the first uh, outbreaks of Ebola. It was in the cover of all the news magazines. Killer virus. And this, of course, was the first emerging virus, Lassa virus, which um, emerged in Nigeria in the uh, 1960s. So the press really loves these Ebola, Lassa, and killer virus stories. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why. I guess they make for good press. So there have been a number in contemporary times, there have been a number of new viruses that have infected humans that we've discovered. An interesting question is, are there really more today than there ever was, or are we just better at detecting them? I personally don't think we have an answer. There are many people who feel that these factors have inevitably, inevitably made it more likely that viruses infect us. So things like uh, globalization, rapid air travel, the ability to travel quickly, huge population growth, deforestation, you take away the forest, but the people who are doing the work encounter pathogens in the forest which haven't been encountered before. Of course, microbes are always evolving, so that is a part of the whole story. We alter ecosystems all the time, and you know, all the environmental changes that we impose, including shipping tires all over the place. Uh, all of these happen on a massive scale that has never happened before, obviously. So you could argue that just by virtue of these changes, there must be more encounters of humans with viruses. <coughs> However, I'm not convinced. I think it's a hard experiment to do. I think we won't know how many infections occurred in the past because there's no record of them. I think lots of infections happened. They may have been small, you know, the Ebola outbreak currently is just over 200 cases. 200 cases of an infection 100 or 200 years ago would probably have not blinked anyone's eye because the mortality rate was so high. So I, I think it's possible that many infections came and went a long time ago and we simply didn't see them. Nevertheless, for the purposes of today's discussion, we'll assume that emerging virus uh, infections are on the rise because of factors like those. And one of the main ones, of course, is uh, human population growth. We are occupying nearly every part of the earth. You can see from this really neat picture uh, of all the city lights and the burning fires in the uh, Amazon that we are really expanding everywhere and that brings us into contact with more viruses. Here's a map of the uh, Amazon basin and uh, it, all these letters that you can't read are various viruses that have been isolated from these regions. Uh, so these were isolates that were actually grown in cell culture at the Evandro Chagas Institute. You can see there are lots of them. There, there are just there are over 100 on this graph. And there are probably many more as well. So if we go into these areas and deforest, for example, we're going to encounter those. And just by chance, one of them might take off one day. So here is a list of some of the current viruses that we consider to be emerging. And what are the particular factors that have led to the emergence of each virus? And for some, we don't really understand why they emerged. So for example, West Nile virus, which we discussed before, was absent in the Western Hemisphere until 1999 when it came to the US, came here into New York City. We don't know really why it came in at that particular time. Certainly global air travel facilitated it, but we'd been flying airplanes since the 50s and 60s. And so why then? We just don't know. Uh, but of course, uh, let's see, C. nombre virus, uh, which we'll talk about today, natural increase of deer mice and, and subsequent contact. Marburg virus, so this is in the same family as Ebola viruses, the Filoviridae. 
Uh, this was first discovered in an outbreak in a primate laboratory in Germany. Some monkeys had been imported from Africa for research, and they had Marburg virus in them, and they infected some of the laboratory workers. And you can see very, all sorts of different uh, factors that led to the emergence. Here's the one I was just talking about, norovirus, new methods for detection. So sometimes the virus is around, but we just haven't been able to check them out. Uh, more human contact with rodents, integrated pig duck agri agriculture, which is a big factor for influenza virus. So even though influenza virus is a well-adapted human pathogen, periodically new pandemic strains every 20, 30, 40 years arise, and these strains have acquired genes from influenza viruses that circulate in animals, in birds and in pigs. So really there is a zoonotic infection with these viruses every so often in people. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the principles first involved, and then we'll go through some specific examples here. Now remember that evolution, which was one of the topics last week, it plays a major role in the ability of a virus to go from an animal host to a human. Viruses generate enormous diversity, as we discussed last time, and so they have the opportunity to adapt to a new pathogen. Somewhere in the pool of genomes, that is the quasi-species, there is one that can infect the new host. So that allows adaptation to new uh, hosts and environments. Right, that's right. All of these are factors in emergence. Deforestation right, so is that, one that of them, but so that first question should others. be up, and it is which of the following can right, play so a role in emergence? All right, so let's talk about host-virus interactions and what they mean for emergence. So here's a scheme of t different sorts of interactions. We have stable interactions between virus and host. That kind of interaction is constant. It maintains the virus in the ecosystem. Then we have evolving. Uh, interactions, and so, uh, so let's say a virus that's infecting an animal in a stable interaction can jump into another host and begin to evolve, and that's shown here by this red arrow emerging infection. So viruses can cross from each of these different patterns into the other. So this is passage of virus to a, a naive population that hasn't seen it before. This can also happen in, in two other ways. So it can uh, go from a stable to a resistant host. Here the virus is not replicating, there's no infection, and that's the end. Or sometimes uh, the virus will infect the host, uh, but that host doesn't spread it to others. So we call that a dead-end infection. So the virus is replicating, it can cause disease, but it's not spreading. So Ebola is sort of an example of this. Uh, again, there are examples of human-to-human -human transmission of Ebola, but only in cases of very close contact. So let's explore some of these. Uh, in a stable host virus interaction, uh, the virus and the host are both surviving and, and, and multiplying. Uh, sometimes these stable interactions are permanent. So, you know, the herpes viruses that we talked about before, uh, they have a permanent uh, interaction with us. They are with us, they enter us at an early age, they're with us for our entire lives. And many other viruses, some of them acute virus infections, are also the only hosts for. Uh, for these viruses. And that's why viruses, of course, some viruses can be eradicated. Um, in some cases, this stable interaction can involve more than one host. It doesn't have to be a single host. It can involve uh, humans and one other species. So these viruses at the bottom, influenza, flavies, and toga viruses involve humans and another host. <clears throat> the evolving a host virus relationship up here. That's again the case where a virus from a stable relationship goes into a new host which has never seen the virus before. These are typically unstable and unpredictable. You don't know what's going to come out of it. Uh, the outcome can be a, a, an inapparent infection or a, a less severe infection uh, to death. And some examples are listed here. For example, the introduction of smallpox uh, and measles into the new world by colonists coming from Europe. S smallpox had been established in Europe uh, for many years. When it was introduced into a new population, it was devastating. West Nile virus into the Western Hemisphere, on the other hand, was not really devastating. It came again from uh, Israel to the U.S. in 1999 and it spread across the U.S., but very low case fatality ratio and really uh, not a serious infection. So those are two uh, distinct uh, outcomes. Smallpox, extremely lethal, 33% case fatality ratio, and much, much lower for West Nile virus. And now sometimes um, the virus is selected that has the ability to uh, infect a new host. 
Uh, sometimes the host changes as well. So conditions like famines, which have occurred periodically in our history, and wars all impose slightly different conditions that can help viruses to jump to a new host. So the 1918 influenza virus pandemic, the biggest flu pandemic in history as far as we know, it's probably more severe, made more severe by a variety of factors, including the fact that there was a war going on at the time, which not only spread the virus efficiently, but uh, resulted in lethality in many victims. Dead end interactions. This is probably a very frequent outcome of uh, cross species infections. Sometimes the host is killed very quickly, and that is a hallmark of Ebola virus infection. Killed very rapidly, people get very sick quickly, they're put in a hospital, and the only individuals they transmit infection to are healthcare workers and their families who are in close contact with them. So it's very difficult to transmit infection. And then there are other cases where uh, even if the, the infected individuals are walking around, they don't transmit well. So H5, influenza H5N1 infections are not transmitted very effectively from human to human. We'll have an entire lecture about that uh, at the end of the course. So these dead end infections really contribute little to the spread of a natural infection. They are really examples of the virus probing new hosts and simply failing. So here is an example of a stable host virus uh, interaction that can lead to dead end infection. So this is an arbovirus, an arthropod-borne virus. And this particular virus has a stable uh, interaction uh, between mosquitoes and wild birds. So the mosquitoes maintain it in wild birds in a cycle. The mosquitoes bite a wild bird. They acquire the virus. They transmit it to a new bird. They can also <coughs> transmit it to domesticated animals, such as chicken. Uh, and the birds can transmit it to other avian hosts via other mosquito species. So this is a stable cycle. The hosts are fine. They don't get sick. Occasionally, these mosquitoes will bite other hosts, like horses or humans. They will deliver uh, the virus to them. The animals may become ill, they may die, but they will not transmit infection. And typically it's because either the mosquito population isn't big enough to sustain transmission or the viremia in the humans isn't high enough to sustain mos mosquito-borne transmission. Because remember, this is the first introduction of the virus into humans and it may not replicate all that effectively. Nevertheless, the humans may get ill, as I said before, but they don't transmit infections. Another example here of a stable host uh, virus interaction involving a tick-borne encephalitis virus. This is simply a variation where the virus is moved among rodents by a tick vector. Uh, and, the tick, and again, the rodents are fine, the ticks are fine. And occasionally, uh, the ticks will infect goats uh, who are also uh, hosts for the virus. But uh, if we either drink goat milk or uh, acquire the virus infection by a tick bite, we are dead end hosts. We get infected, we may get serious disease, but we don't uh, transmit the virus to others. All right, so those are examples of dead end infections. Here are a couple more uh, to show you. Yellow fever is maintained in a monkey mosquito cycle. Humans are dead end hosts. Uh, Marburg and Ebola, the filoviruses. Hendra and Nipah, which we'll talk about today, uh, the progenitor of SARS virus. Now, the progenitor SARS virus itself can transmit among humans, but the progenitor does not transmit very well. Uh, Lassa, Hunin, and Sinobre, which are rodent viruses. All, again, dead-end infections in humans. We'll talk about uh, Sinobre. <coughs> and really, when you think of it, laboratory animal models are typically dead-end infection. They rarely transmit well to other laboratory animals. It's because they're artificial. We're putting virus into a host where it normally doesn't go. They have to work very hard to get viruses to transmit among laboratory animals. And that's one of the things we'll talk about in the H5N1 lecture. All right, next question is, which type of viral infection maintains virus in the ecosystem? OK, you're right. Number one is the answer. Stable interactions. That's the one that maintains the virus. All the others do not, because the evolving is unpredictable. You don't know if it will end up becoming a stable interaction. Of course, dead end and resistant hosts, hosts do not transmit infection. All right, so let's talk about how you 
uh, establish an emerging infection. Of course, the virus has to be introduced into a new species, so there has to be an opportunity for interaction of, of an animal host that's infected in a different host. And then the virus has to be established in that host and disseminate. So these are not trivial factors. It's not easy. Encountering a new virus may be relatively easy, depending on where you are. But having that infect a host and then replicate to high enough titers so it's transmitted is not very easy. And of course, the best routes are respiratory and gastrointestinal spread. Uh, other routes are more difficult. So encountering new hosts, most of the time, we never detect them when we get infected from a new virus. If you go into an exotic location, if you happen to go to the rainforest, you may uh, pick up a virus infection, but you may never know because it either doesn't replicate or it doesn't uh, cause any symptoms. And these single host infections are typically not transmitted. They may, the virus may not replicate properly. If it does, the, you may not be in contact with other humans to allow it to transmit. There are many reasons why uh, they might not go on. Now, as we'll see when we talk about the evolution of HIV from SIV, we actually think this was a one-host infection. That one person infected with S SIV initiated the entire HIV pandemic. But for the most part, there are many special circumstances that took place, which we'll talk about. For, for the most part, that's simply not going to happen. So remember, for when a virus enters you, a brand new virus that you've never seen before. It needs to find both susceptible and permissive cells, cells with receptors and cells that can replicate your virus. And if you're going to transmit it, the population density is important. You have to be in an area with a lot of people for the most part. So the person who acquired that first SIV infection, you will see, was not in an area of high population density. But circumstances change that. Health of you or the people around you is also important. If you're not healthy, you may be less susceptible. Poor nutrition may play a role. And of course, you need to have serial infections to maintain a virus. So it has to go from you to another person to another person. And there are just not that many zoonotic infections of humans. You saw that original pie graph that have <laughs> adapted to be able to transmit in this fashion. There are many that get into us and cause disease but are simply not transmitted because there's so many factors that come into play. We have plenty of ways to encounter new viruses and these are just some of them. And most of these are brand new, I think, and haven't occurred before in our history. You know, air travel is pretty new. Making a dam and holding water back is relatively new and that changes the ecology and allows for new encounters. Hot tubs I think are probably new. I mean, people probably soaked in hot water long ago, but they didn't chlorinate them, I guess. Air conditioning, blood transfusion is relatively new. Transplanting organs, which can transplant infections. We move animals all over the world now. We never used to do that. And we move their viruses uh, with them. And all sorts of the tires. Daycare centers is one of my favorites. I used to get sick all the time when my kids were in preschool and early school. And that's something that we never did before. So a lot of factors for encountering new viruses. We don't have to just focus on today, though, to understand emerging viruses. If you look back in history, there are many cases where virus infections and outbreak played a role in, in the progress of history. and so. This, these are examples where a brand new virus was introduced into a naive population and it wiped out many of the individuals who were infectious. Now these were human viruses to begin with, so smallpox, which had come to Europe from the Far East probably in about 700 AD, it was a terrible disease at the time. It was ravaging uh, both the Far East and Europe, Came, was brought to the US as I mentioned by explorers killed three and a half million Aztecs in two years. Uh, and that allowed Cortez, of course, to simply walk in with a band of conquistadors and take over this whole civilization. I mean, he wasn't able to do that on his own. He had help from viruses. There's also evidence that measles virus had a, had a role in this as well. So the New World had never seen smallpox virus before because nobody went across the ocean, of course, right? All the land bridges were gone that allowed travel on foot, 
And so it was not until the explorers went across, they brought the virus with them. They introduced it now in a population which has no antibodies against the virus whatsoever. And uh, that's what happens. It's really quite uh, amazing. Yellow fever is another example of this. Yellow fever is a tropical virus. It is sustained in a stable cycle between mosquitoes and monkeys in the forest. Okay? And when humans go into the forest, for example, to build the Panama Canal, we start getting bitten by uh, virus, uh, mosquitoes carrying yellow fever virus, and we get the disease. This is why the virus was discovered, because as we were trying to build the Panama Canal, the workers were dying. So we sent physicians down to figure it out, and they figured out that it was mosquito-borne, and then eventually that it was uh, yellow fever. That was among the earliest viruses to be discovered. It one, at one time, yellow fever was as far north as Boston in the US because we imported slaves from south, southern regions and they were infected with yellow fever uh, and they spread the disease among humans. So here, for example, is an outbreak of yellow fever in Philadelphia in 1793. Uh, in July of that year, the, the virus arrived from Santo Domingo, probably in a shipment of slaves. And then it began to spread uh, among humans in Philadelphia. The weather was warm enough to sustain the mosquito population. And lots of cases, 10,000 cases, 5,000 deaths. So again, this is a naive population. They'd never seen this virus before. It finally, the epidemic broke uh, in October when the temperature dropped and then the mosquitoes died off. So there could no longer be transmission. But even Thomas Jefferson said, that this virus would discourage, well, he didn't know it was a virus. He said yellow fever will discourage the growth of great cities in our nation. Of course, he didn't take a virology course, so he couldn't have known that that wasn't possible everywhere in the US. So those are examples where you put virus in a naive population and it has consequences. So this is one of the fears, I think, that today a brand new virus will be introduced into a totally naive population and cause problems. And of course, we have seen that with HIV for sure, but all of the other ones have had limited spread, as you will see. Uh, here's an example of how changes in our environment can change the pattern of infection. So as far as we know, poliomyelitis has been around since the, the uh, time of, of the Egyptians in uh, 4,000 years ago. Um, because this, uh, this carving of a priest with a leg looks like he had polio. And there are reports in the literature of diseases that look like polio over the years. There's just a few cases here and there. It was not epidemic. But suddenly, at the beginning of the 20th century, we had big outbreaks of polio, uh, hundreds and then thousands of cases at once. Why all of a sudden did the disease change from sporadic to epidemic? Well, the answer is that uh, improved sanitation, which came about at the turn of the century, the 20th century, delayed infection. So normally you were born, you'd get infected as a baby because sanitation was poor. You had fecal contamination everywhere. But you had antibodies from your mother, and they protected you from, from paralytic disease. And if you delay infections, those antibodies go away, and then you're susceptible. And you have pools of individuals who suddenly, when the virus is introduced into them, you have an outbreak of polio. And so here you can see this. Uh, before the late 1800s, no cases of polio that were really reported. And then all of a sudden, the first, uh, this is in the US, at the end of the 1800s, a case, uh, an outbreak in Vermont. And then you can see uh, outbreaks of various sizes, a big one in 1915 in the Northeast, 28,000 cases. This is a very funny uh, sticker that was placed on the houses of people. Keep out of this house because they had a case of polio in the house. So they would put stickers on. Do you think this would have any effect on the transmission of disease? No, because 99 other people are walking around infected without paralytic disease. OK, let's talk about some examples of emerging infections. The first one uh, comes from bats. Bats have a huge number of viruses in them. People are doing uh, metagenomic analyses. They take samples from bats and they sequence it. And you find literally hundreds of new viruses in these bats. We don't understand actually why they're so infected. They seem to be perfectly healthy. But they are a source of zoonotic infections. And um, these two viruses, Nipah virus and Hendra, 
have been isolated from flying foxes uh, and they cause disease in horses and pigs and humans. This is a flying fox. It's about, it's about this big. It's really big. If you ever go to uh, Australia or other parts down there, you can see them. They're really impressive. Anyway, so there have been a couple of outbreaks uh, of, of viruses uh, derived from these. So these Hendra and Nipah uh, are sh now called Hennepa viruses. So Nipah was the first uh, isolated. It was an outbreak in Malaysia in 1998 of respiratory and neurological disease uh, on pig farms. So the humans working on these pig farms were getting sick, respiratory and neurological diseases. 105 human deaths, so they killed all the pigs. They killed a million pigs, and they stopped uh, the spread of infections. And what happened was, the pigs are not the host of the virus. The fruit bats or the flying foxes are the host. Uh, they excrete the virus in the urine. As, as I've said, the bats are fine. They don't get sick. But the pig farmers plant mangoes near the pig pens so that the pigs, I guess, can eat the mangoes. The bats like to feed on the mangoes, so at night they come by, they eat the mangoes, and they urinate, and they drop pieces on the ground that are contaminated with virus. The pigs come and eat them, they get infected, and then later the humans are working with the pigs and they get infected as well. So a very efficient way of infecting people. So this is spread from bat to pig to human. So it's an example of encroaching on the bat habitat. You're planting trees, well, first of all, you're putting pig farms near bat habitats, and then you're planting food for the bats right near your pig farms. Uh, subsequently, in, in India and Bangladesh, there have been further outbreaks where the virus has been traced to the consumption of date palm sap. So what people do in these areas is they attach uh, siphons to the date palm trees to collect sap. And these are typically done in open containers. And epidemiologists noticed that the people who were getting Nipah infections, one common thing is that they had all drunk date palm sap. Okay, apparently this is a delicious thing to drink and it's highly prized. And uh, they set up cameras at night and they saw bats coming to drink the, bait, the date palm sap. And so they were contaminating it and then people would drink it and get infected. So a very low tech solution was simply to supply covers on these date palm sap collectors, and that really cuts down on the outbreak. Now the problem in these areas is that when someone dies, the family has to prepare the body for burial. So you have very close contact with the dead person. And this ended up transmitting the infection from the initial infected person to others in the family. And that's a very difficult situation to deal with because you can't tell them you can't prepare the body. That's part of what they do. And so it's, been, it's hard to contain these outbreaks when they occur. But there have been human-to-human -human transmissions. These outbreaks occur regularly because there's always contact with bats in these regions. Hendra virus is the other virus. It's also a paramyxovirus like Nipah. Uh, it was first recognized in Hendra, Australia in September of 1994. There was an outbreak on a farm where they bred racehorses. And there were the, the 14 racehorses and a trainer that cared for the racehorse uh, died. This one turned out to be spread from, it's a different virus from Nipah, but the same family. It was spread from flying foxes to horses and then to humans. So again, the flying foxes at night come into the area where the horses are kept, and they apparently contaminate material, which perhaps the horses are eating. Uh, the horses get infected. It's lethal for horses. Uh, and they pass it on to humans probably because the humans are working closely. The trainers and people who care for these horses uh, work closely with them uh, and they transmit it to humans. But, uh, but again, the, this doesn't get spread to the general population. It's limited to those initially contacted. These outbreaks continue to occur uh, from time to time because the, you can't get rid of the flying foxes, of course, nor, nor would you want to. So this is a map of the geographic distribution of Hennepa virus. So that's Hendra and Nipah virus, and these are both outbreaks, as well as fruit bats, which are in this family, Turopodidae. These are Hendra outbreaks down here in Australia. There have been a few up here in Malaysia. Uh, these are Nipah outbreaks, the red dots. And there, there's also uh, isolation, Hendra up here in, in India as well. There's been also isolations uh, of viruses from bats 
uh, which are not necessarily associated with cases. So this isolation here in Africa uh, and Madagascar, these are from bats in the absence of cases in humans. So the virus is elsewhere in flying foxes. Uh, and so the potential for outbreaks in other areas are, are, are obviously there. Okay, so that's an example of a, an emerging infection because of altered contact of human with wildlife. But again, these haven't spread. They're scary because a lot of people die, but they don't spread to the general population. The virus simply is unable to adapt to a form that can spread efficiently, which is good for us, of course. Another example is changing climate and animal population. So this is an outbreak of a, caused by a virus called C. nombre virus. It was first recognized uh, in the Four Corners area. Uh, that's here in the US where the four states come together. Um, there was an outbreak of severe respiratory disease, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. The first in a very healthy young man who suddenly came to the emergency room with uh, fulminant uh, pneumonia and died very quickly. Turned out to be caused by C. nombre virus, which is a member of the hantavirus family. It's a bunya virus with a segmented RNA genome. It's enveloped. Uh, this virus is endemic in the deer mouse. The deer mouse is Paramiscus maniculatus. If you just go out in the wild and trap Paramiscus mice, 30% of them will be carrying uh, this virus, C. nombre virus. So this virus, so it's been present in the US for many years, but suddenly in 1993, it started infecting humans. By the way, it was originally called Muerto Canyon virus because that's the name of the place where it was first found. But the people who lived in Muerto Canyon didn't want their town to be sullied by a virus that was lethal. So they petitioned the CDC to change the name. They came up with a few other names, but they didn't like any of them. So they called it Sin Nombre, which of course means no name, right? So it's a little dig at them, I suppose. Now, why did this virus start infecting people? It turns out in 1992, there was a lot of rain in this area. And that meant there were a lot of pignon nuts, which people cultivate because they like to eat them uh, and mice also like to eat them as well and so the mice ate more pignon nuts they multiplied as as things work and more mice more uh, likelihood of contact with people so the mice get into people's homes uh, the virus is excreted in feces the mice come in your house they, they defecate uh, on your blankets or on your floor so when mice defecate, the feces dry out quickly because they're small. And when you go to sweep them up, you aerosolize the virus. You inhale it, it goes into your lungs, and then you get hantapulmonary syndrome. This virus is here in the Northeast as well. So in fact, if you ever see mouse droppings, you shouldn't just wipe them up. You should spray them with some bleach solution and inactivate the virus first and then scoop them up. I understand if it's on your beautiful red carpet, that's not going to be a good solution, but you don't want to aerosolize the virus. Okay, figure out something. So it turned out that retrospectively, um, uh, there have been some cases that fit the definition as far back as 1959. So these have apparently gone into humans as far back as then. We just didn't recognize them. But in 1992, there, this outbreak was caused by abundant rainfall. The next question is, Hennepa virus emergence into new species can largely be attributed to number four. But some of you are wandering around here uncertain. We've got a little two and three and five. So let's see what, what you're thinking here. So Hennepa virus emergence happens. So the, the NEPA is infection of pigs and humans. Flying foxes eat the mangoes. So we build pig farms next to bat habitats. Uh, Hennepa virus, we put horse farms next to bat habitats. So the, both cases were encroaching in the flying fox habitat. Of course, we didn't know this, right? No, no one thought, hey, there's going to be a bat there that's going to transmit a virus. It's only in retrospect that we say, ah, we shouldn't have done this. But in the future, we should avoid such things, if possible. I'm not sure, since there's so many of us now, if we can do that. Butchering of flying foxes, no. I don't think any of you answered that. These viruses are not transmitted by mosquitoes, so that's not an issue. No global air travel, that's not a factor. Okay. Um, this, this is 
sorry, the quiz, uh, the quiz question was in the wrong place because we're still on Paramiscus maniculatus. This is an interesting slide showing you the distribution of this mouse, the white-footed deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus. So you can see the green area is where that mouse is found. We don't actually have it uh, here in New York, but it is in upstate New York. And the uh, yellow dots are the cases of um, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. There have been 616 in 34 states uh, since, since, as of December uh, 2012. And here is a breakdown of the cases by state. You can see most of the cases are in the Midwest to the West, which is mainly where uh, the, the mouse, the mice are found. But this virus is also in other mouse species. So in, in addition to the deer mouse, it's in the white-footed mouse, it's in the rice rat, and the cotton rat. But it's not in Norwegian rats, for example, or other rodent species. And someone told me once, I, I am involved in a project to trap wild mice and look at the viruses that are in them. And he told me I should actually be wearing a BSL-3 suit because 30% of the mice I trap could have a C. nombre virus in. So that's what they do when they do that. But, but I don't. <laughs> and maybe, that's, maybe that's why I got sick. <laughs> why not? I just can't see myself standing in the woods with this full blue suit on with a respirator. I'm just not doing that. I'll be fine. Uh, so if you camp, you have to be careful if you camp because there are mice out there. And if you camp in some of these uh, structures, wooden structures, so sometimes there's a platform and you put your tent on it. The mice can live under it and leave droppings there. And, and last two years ago, there were, I think, two cases of HPS in Californians, one of them died, uh, and these were in these um, structures. You can't find where it is. It's these these uh, tenting structures that uh, harbored mice. So it's not just mice coming into your home, but if you go out there, uh, you can you can acquire it as well. So just be careful. Now there are lots of other hantaviruses out there. This is just a partial listing of what we call New World hantaviruses in the North and South America. Um, here's C. nombre. Right, which is in Paramiscus maniculatus, but these are all different viruses. Mule shoe, mule shoe is a virus of cotton rats, Sigma don hispidus, Isla Vista, well, North America, and a bunch in South America and Central America as well. Uh, and the orange ones have been associated with human infections. So again, these are various rodent hosts, and any contact of humans with rodents or potentially can lead to hantavirus infections. So this zoonotic infection just is a warning that there are lots of potential viruses out there. And if we intrude upon them, uh, we can get uh, more infections. Now the next virus I want to talk about is SARS. So this is a very well documented and more extensive outbreak. This began uh, in 2003. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of ProMed Mail, but it is a uh, it's a website where infectious disease outbreaks are reported on an hourly basis. And he, this was an email posted uh, on this day in February from this uh, physician who said, I received an email and searched your archives and didn't find anything. Have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room reports that hospitals have been closed and people are dying. So in the early days of this outbreak, um, the Chinese authorities didn't share any information about it. And so emails like this were the first indication that something was going on. So it turned out that there were, this involved an outbreak of what was called severe atypical pneumonia, and that's where the name of the virus came from, severe acute respiratory syndrome, initially of unknown etiology, initiating in the Guangdong province of China uh, in November of 2002. There were 300 cases and five deaths in that initial outbreak. Short incubation period, typical fever and, and nonspecific viral uh, incubation symptoms, and then dry cough, shortness of breath, and sometimes serious uh, lung disease that may, may require mechanical uh, ventilation. Now, a Chinese doctor who treated some of those patients in that first outbreak, he was well. He traveled to Hong Kong on February 21st, 2003. He stayed at this hotel, the Metropole Hotel, which is now infamous because of what I'm going to tell you. He got sick and went to the hospital and died the next day. 
Turned out he had SARS. He had acquired it from one of his patients. He spread it to 10 people in the hotel, and they then flew on to various countries, including Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, and the US, and they all left uh, Hong Kong before they had any symptoms, so they brought the virus with them. And they were, this guy was really the initial spreader from where the virus went global. And eventually it infected 8,000 people in 29 countries, the mortality rate uh, 10%. So this is an interesting epidemiological chart. Here is that initial patient uh, in the Hotel Metropole. Okay, he came from Guangdong province and he infected, uh, well, he went to the hospital here. He actually you know, got some people in the hospital sick as well but he infected all these individuals who then went to Vietnam, and this one infected uh, 37 healthcare workers and 21 close contacts. This one went to Singapore, US, Ireland, and Canada. And of course, from there, the virus went elsewhere as well. So this virus obviously had acquired the ability to spread very effectively from person to person. So this is the epidemic curve uh, from the beginning in February, peaking in March, and then declining ended July 2003, uh, 1,753 cases. And this was the global distribution, um, 1,700 in uh, Hong Kong, 5,300 in China, which is the origin, uh, and then fewer cases elsewhere. Again, total 8,000 cases uh, with a 10% case fatality ratio. And this SARS virus is a coronavirus. Uh, they are enveloped viruses with a very long RNA genome of plus polarity uh, with spike glycoproteins in the envelope. We've talked briefly about before. Uh, you acquire the infection via respiratory droplets, in enters the respiratory tracts, replicates in the mucosal epithelium, and is largely limited to the epithelial layer uh, where it causes severe lung injury. And there's some evidence that the virus is very good at immune suppression, which may be part of the reason why it causes such a severe disease. Why did the infection end? Well, we didn't have an antiviral. We didn't have a vaccine. But a lot of public health measures were taken, which I think had a big impact. And so this is, this is actually one of my favorite posters. Hong Kong will take your breath away. This is actually, this is actually a tourism poster, but in the aftermath of the outbreak, it's very apropos, right? And this is the uh, airport in Hong Kong during the outbreak. It's virtually deserted. So the Chinese authorities limited travel. They developed, and this was where these temperature sensors were developed. You went in the airport, and in addition to taking off your clothes and everything to go through security, you had to go through a temperature scanner. And if you had a temperature, you went back to your hotel. You were not allowed to travel. And I think this really stopped a, a lot of spread of the disease. And there was a lot of public information distributed in the form of posters uh, calling the disease atypical pneumonia, which is what it was. So it was a very big public information campaign, limitation of travel. I think that's eventually why uh, the disease burned out. So these are some of these uh, measures that I've talked about. Surveillance was very good, early <laughs> warning, case investigation. You've seen the, ma the amazing case tracing that I've shown you from the Hotel Metropole. And as I said, no vaccine, no antivirals. Travel restrictions and quarantine were a big uh, part of this, as well as public education. Now, quarantine worked, of course, because most of the infections are apparent. There are not a lot of inapparent infections. So this is a model for how to control a disease. This was really the first big emerging outbreak where we were in a position to control. We learned a lot from it and we use this now as a model for what to do in the future if a similar situation happens. So where did this virus come from? So let's, let's talk about this. Um, sera from people that were collected before the outbreak did not have antibodies to the virus. So that meant this was a new virus entering the human population. And the earliest cases in Guangdong province in China were handlers of animals for the exotic food market. So there used to be exotic food markets such as these where you could buy animals that were trapped uh, from the countryside and they were presented raw here. So obviously good potential for transmission. So these individuals were among the first SARS cases and they ended up having uh, higher antibodies to the virus than other groups of individuals. 
So here's a, gr a chart, a table showing you antibodies in, in a vari variety of people with different occupations in Guangdong province. Wild animal traders, 40% uh, antibody positive. These are antibodies to SARS coronavirus specifically. Animal slaughterers, 20%. Uh, the vegetable handlers, less. And control population. Uh, these are hospital workers who didn't deal with respiratory infections. They had no antibodies. So again, strongly suggestion that uh, working with animals is a risk factor. Initially, the virus was isolated from palm civets, which this is a palm civet right here. And these are some of the wild animals that are sold in these, uh, it, these open markets. So they took some of these and they sampled and they found the virus in them. So the early idea was that maybe this virus went from civets to humans. Um, so they prevented sale of uh, civets. They killed many civets that were out there that they could find. But it turned out these are probably not the reservoir because the viruses from civets were all too similar to implicate them as a reservoir. Usually when an animal is a reservoir for a virus, there's a lot of diversity in the viruses you isolate them. And then finally, when people went to, on farms that grow civets or, wild, or caught wild civets, they never got viruses from them. So only the civets in the market actually had uh, virus in them. It turned out that a, a horseshoe bat was the culprit. This is a horseshoe bat up here. Um, they uh, eventually found SARS-like coronaviruses from various species of horseshoe bats in di geographically diverse regions of China. And many of them had antibodies to the virus and very similar to viruses isolated from both people uh, and civets. And here, the, the genetic diversity in the horseshoe bat was much greater than either in people or civets. So this is most likely the reservoir uh, of the virus. So the idea is that the bats are the reservoir in nature. They're infected and they seem to be fine. It's transmitted to humans via the civets. But we don't actually know how the virus gets from the bat to the civets. That really hasn't been solved yet. It may be that a few of them are infected and the rare ones transmit them to humans. Now, the, the viruses that are in bats are not good at infecting people. The virus that transmitted among people has undergone a number of mutations that adapts it to grow better in people. And the major mutations seem to be in the virus receptor interaction. So this is a major determinant of the species specificity of coronavirus infection. So the bat viruses bind to bat receptors really well, but not to human receptors. This human SARS viruses bind really well to human receptors. And this is a cartoon showing that um, finding. So here is a, on the top, these uh, light colored blobs are supposed to be the receptor molecule. And at the bottom is the coronavirus spike glycoprotein, which is binding the receptor. You remember, this is a long time ago, I know, but the glycoprotein has to bind the receptor to initiate infection. So here's uh, the, the receptor for human SARS virus is the virus that transmits well among humans. It's a protein called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme, number two. It's actually a cell surface enzyme. Uh, it binds very well to the human SARS spike glycoprotein. This is the human SARS receptor. It does not bind well to the glycoprotein of SARS isolated from civets. So the civet SARS glycoprotein is slightly different. It has a couple of amino acid changes from humans. It doesn't bind well. So those viruses have to undergo changes in order to replicate well in humans and bind the receptor very well, as shown here. Um, here on the, in, the, in the third panel is the human SARS receptor interacting with a virus that emerged later in China, separate from this epidemic that I just described. It was uh, from a different, a new introduction of virus from bats into people. And this only infected a few people and didn't spread very effectively. And the reason is because uh, the, the glycoprotein of the virus did not interact well with the cellular receptor. So because of these bits of evidence, we think that the receptor interaction was the key part of allowing this SARS virus to evolve and infect humans uh, efficiently. So the virus, imagine the virus in bats pops into civets. 
and maybe that's a required intermediate to ad adapt to a civet receptor. And then it goes into humans, those first animal traders in Guangzhou. It replicates in them, and maybe you select a population that now binds to the human receptor really well, and that takes off and infects many other people. That's the scenario anyway. So is this virus going to come back? Uh, it turns out that precursors of the SARS virus are still out there in animals. You can find them in bats in China up to this day. Wild uh, meat, wild animal sale has been banned in China, but there's always uh, illegal ways to get it. So there's always the possibility that it could be introduced into humans. Uh, there was a second outbreak, as I just mentioned, only four cases of a new human uh, animal to human transmission, but this virus didn't make it. But I think now we are ready for a new outbreak. If we see it, we're going to recognize it and contain it. And we still don't have vaccines or antivirals. Let's take a long time to develop, uh, but people still continue to work on that. The next question is, re resolution of the SARS outbreak is an example of how we can prevent spread of a virus through, you got it, use of quarantine containment measures, no antivirals, no vaccines, and I'm glad you didn't choose antibiotics. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, we recently have found a new coronavirus, and this comes from the Middle East. Uh, the first case, September 2012, 60-year-old male patient died of pneumonia and kidney failure. The virus was actually isolated and, and cultured in cells. The genome was sequenced. The receptor was identified all within months. It's amazing speed of, of all this being done. And it's closely related to bat coronaviruses, but it's not SARS. It's a, it's a different virus. And this is the outbreak so far to the end of 2003. Uh, there are now more than 180 cases, but you can see uh, the disease outbreak here. These are all laboratory confirmed cases. MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And the cases have largely been in the Middle East, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Oman. A few of them have gone to other countries. So as you know, the uh, people in this area have access to global health care. So they often, when they get sick, they go to hospitals in France or the UK. And so these have been imported cases. But as far as we know, no, none have originated uh, outside of the Middle East. And as of the end, uh, beginning of March, 184 cases, 80 deaths, which is a 43% case fatality ratio. We don't know the mortality ratio. We don't know how many people are infected and have antibodies. It's very hard to get this data from these countries. <clears throat> now, uh, back in, uh, I think at the end of last year, a paper was published uh, in, in Emerging Infectious Diseases by my colleague at Columbia, Ian Lipkin, who found in one bat, he went to Saudi Arabia and sampled bats, and he found in one bat a 190 nucleotide PCR fragment that matched perfectly the MERS coronavirus. Okay? So um, well, people started saying that this shows that bats are the origin of this virus. And then, I think the next day in the New York Times, Don McNeil wrote this article, Mystery Virus That's Killed 47, the case count was lower back then, is tied to bats. Health officials confirmed Wednesday that bats in Saudi Arabia were the source of the mysterious virus. So this just rubbed me the wrong way. 190 nucleotides from one bat, and the New York Times is saying this. So I wrote Don McNeil, and I said, you know, a lot of people read your paper, and you really shouldn't write this because it's not true. And I told him all the different ways that um, this could be wrong. So then he finally wrote an article. Some scientists cast <laughs> out. <laughs> okay. And so he, he said, the first scientist to question the discovery, that's nice. But, but look what he said. Look what he said. Some professional jealousies may be fueling the controversy. <laughs> See, Dr. Ian Lipkin, a, a microbe hunter, and, you know, the, he, he worked on contagion. So he's saying, I'm jealous, and that's why I question him. <laughs> he can be sharp-tongued about his critics. I'm good friends with Ian, but I told him. We had him on TWIV, actually, after this. And uh, I, I said, this isn't right. Okay, so... <laughs> 
So Ian went back to Saudi Arabia and he started sampling camels, dromedary camels. Those are the ones with one hump. Okay? There are lots of them in this region. They use them for food, for pets, and for racing. There are lots of them in this area. And in some of the early cases, there were histories of contact with camels. So uh, Ian found antibodies in camels throughout Saudi Arabia. All these dots are areas where he found antibodies to this virus in camels. He also found uh, PCR positivity in na nasal washes throughout the country in multiple animals, not just one. And finally, they got the virus out of camels. Okay, so the point is you have to be critical. You ha and 190 nucleotides is not enough to say you have the virus. You actually have to have antibodies. You have to have the virus itself. And now he's finally got this. I think it's important to, to be vigilant because the Times has a big readership. Uh, so there are lots of questions about this virus. So it looks like it goes from camels to people. Are they really the reservoir? If you go back to the 90s, you can actually find an antibody positive camels, and that's part of the Lipkin study. So if camels have been uh, infected for a long time, why only recently are people being infected? Now, a lot of the people who are getting sick have underlying health problems. They have diabetes or renal problems or immunosuppression. That may be part of it. But presumably, these individuals have always had camels. So what's the story? We don't know. What's the role of bats? Did, did a bat eventually infect the camel? We really don't know. We don't know how it's transmitted. I asked Ian Lipkin, and he said, well, you know, Vinny, camels are pretty messy. They slobber all over the place. So it could be, you know, you go out to pet your camel, and you get camel spit on you, and you could pick up the virus. That remains to be seen. Why are so few humans infected? It doesn't seem to spread from person to person. The initial cases, it may be some contacts in hospital, and that's it. We don't know why that is. Probably it would be a good idea to vaccinate camels, if anything, to protect humans. The camels don't seem to be getting sick from this infection. It might be also good to make antivirals so you can treat infected people, because right now there is no treatment, and many of the patients die, as you saw. So it's interesting that Many of the coronaviruses that we have now that infect people, and this is a list of them, have come from animals. And that's just consistent with what I've been telling you all day. So before SARS, there were uh, four different coronaviruses that basically caused mild respiratory tract infections. Um, you can see 2290, NL63, OC43, HKU1. And at least three of them seem to have come from animals, two from bats and one from cows. There's good sequence evidence for this. SARS coronavirus seems to have come from a bat, and MERS coronavirus seems to come from a camel. So this is just an emphasis of what I told you initially. We get all our new viruses from animals. The last example has nothing to do with people, well, in a peripheral way, I guess. But emerging viruses don't only need to affect people. They can infect animals as well. And this is canine parvovirus, which is a relatively new infection of dogs. It was identified first in 1978, a brand new disease causing enteric and myocardial infection in dogs. If you have a dog, you have to get it immunized against this virus because it may likely kill them. This virus evolved from a cat virus called feline panleukopenia virus. Another member of the same virus family, it's a parvovirus, those small single-stranded DNA virus. This virus infects cats and causes leukopenia, as the name suggests, but it didn't infect dogs. But all of a sudden, in 1978, it evolved to do so. And what happened was, the, so here we have a cartoon of this very interesting evolution. Uh, so we have feline panleukopenia virus, which infects cats, but not dogs. Uh, somewhere in this time period, what happened was FPV gained the ability to bind the transferrin receptor of dogs, and it could now infect dogs. It then spread uh, within a year globally. It spread throughout the world. We don't actually know where this virus originated, but it spread throughout the world, and now it infects dogs globally. It's actually diversified into two different strains, one that can infect cats and dogs, so if you have a cat, you should also get it immunized against this canine parvovirus. 
uh, and the second strain that only infects dogs. Two amino acid changes in the capsid now allows this virus to bind the transferrin receptor of dogs. So here is the virus capsid in blue, and in gray is the transferrin receptor, and it's binding the virus. Two amino acids is all it took. So somehow the virus probably got into a dog, and you, again, you have a, a, a quasi-species, and there was a minute population that was able to bind the dog receptor, and then it took off. So the fellow who works on this, Colin Parrish, is up at Cornell in Ithaca. And I often ask him how this virus could spread globally, because you know, I'm not aware that dogs travel all that much, right? Are you? So he said, Vinny, just look at the bottom of your feet. Yeah, you're in Paris, you step on dog poop, then you fly the next day to New York, you spread the virus. So that's probably what it is, in fact, that it's being spread globally by dog feces, not by the movement of dogs themselves. So there are uh, many examples of new emerging infections, not only of people, but of uh, non-humans as well. So how often does it happen? That's a good question. Probably there are lots of dead-end infections. The ones that produce sustaining transmission are pretty rare. HIV is the biggest one in recent years. SARS didn't sustain, it's gone, maybe because we intervened. We can't predict that, but we know that they're gonna happen and we should be ready. And we have a lot of experience now and there are entire university departments that are built on being prepared for these kinds of outbreaks. So this is a summary of what we need to do. We, we, of course, need to continue to do research so we can understand how these infections emerge. Early detection is good. We have lots of molecular techniques that allow us to identify viruses and sequence their genomes very quickly. And all the sequences are put in a database. So any new sequence is available to anybody. So if you get a new isolate, you can immediately figure out uh, what, it, what it means. And there are all sorts of first responder actions and communication networks that have been built up. Uh, vaccines, drug stockpiles, and quarantines. You know, the vaccines and drug stockpiles take a long time to develop. But quarantines, if, if it's a virus like SARS that causes a lot of overt disease, uh, works as well. And communication is really important. So China learned from the early days of SARS that they need to communicate. And as we'll talk about when we talk about flu later on, there's been a recent epidemic of new uh, avian influenza in China. And from day one, they have communicated that information globally. And it made it easier for them to track down what was going on. So this is essential no matter what country uh, that you're from.